cell theory. So a big part of the cell theory that we talked about in our first week is that all cells have to come from pre-existing cells. Now where the first cells came from, again, is kind of in a gray area in science as of right now. But so because cells come from pre-existing cells, then that means that existing cells have to reproduce to give to give rise to new cells. So this doesn't happen like cells don't divide through like actual division. Instead, they copy their genetic material. So it's not like the whole cell. If something is made out of eukaryotes, does that mean it has no nucleus? Okay, so first are eukaryotes the ones that have nucleus or nuclei or prokaryotes. So I think you guys are confusing prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So you means true and carry means nut. So the nucleus kind of looks like a nut. So that's how I remember that eukaryotes are the ones with nuclei. And so Alvin makes a good point in that there aren't multicellular prokaryotes. So they don't have nuclei. They're just like cells. So they reproduce through something called binary fission, which we will look at later in this lesson. So first, we're just going to focus on like the normal prokaryotic cell. And that's why you see the diagram here. It has nucleus written on it. So. First, some uh, definitions. So the genome is all of a cell's combined genetic material, and genetic material is found in DNA, which codes for instructions for the cell. So one human cell actually can have two meters of DNA in length. So that just shows how much genetic information goes into each of our cells. And so this DNA and genetic materials is packaged into chromosomes. And chromosomes are a combination of DNA and these proteins called histones. So histones just basically help chromosomes maintain their like scissor-like structure. Oh, oops, accidentally. Okay, one on the other side. All right. So as you can see at the diagram on the right, so you have a nucleus and then you have a bunch of small little like X's and then those are chromosomes. And so an anatomy of a chromosome is shown on the diagram as well. So each chromosome is made out of two sister chromatids. And so all along the chromosome, there's like a bunch of genes. And as you can see, it gets magnified and shows you like the DNA and stuff. So when a cell divides, again, it's not actually just like pinching it in half. Instead, it copies this DNA, and then this DNA separates into two nuclei. And so that process, without like having two parents, just like one cell dividing or copying its genetic material and chromosomes and forming two new nuclei, that's called mitosis, and then the actual forming to nuclei part is cytokinesis. So uh, another vocabulary word that we'll have to deal with is diploid. So this means that their chromosomes occur in pairs versus haploid. This just means that there's like one set of each chromosome. So Somatic cells are every cell in the body that doesn't deal with like sexual reproduction. So these cells are usually diploid because they're not going to fuse with other cells. Whereas gametes are haploid because they only have one set of they only have a set of chromosomes because you get one set from your mom and one set from your dad. So after they come together, they become diploid. And so this process is called meiosis, and it's what gives rise to humans and other beings with genetic, genetic diversity. Otherwise, we would all be clones. Well, yeah. Okay, so 
All of this dividing process takes kind of a long time because cells need to take their DNA and replicate it. And it's not just like a random process. They have to undergo a very specific cell cycle. And so the phase where they actually form two new cells is called the mitotic or M phase. And this is actually the shortest phase of the cell cycle. And it follows a general phase called interphase, which makes up 90% of the entire time span. And so in interphase, there are even more separate phases where the cell undergoes growth and also copies its genetic material to be formed and packaged into these two new nuclei. So the first phase is called G1 and it's called first gap. And then, so here the cell just grows replenishes its material and gets ready for the S phase or for or its full name synthesis. And this is where the chromosomes actually copy themselves. And then the second growth phase is G2. And then following G2 is the mitotic phase where they divide. Oh, and the mitotic phase is made out of mitosis and cytokinesis. So what is mitosis or what are mitosis's phases? So starting from G2, so this is still not part of the M phase, this is part of interphase. So we can see that here the nucleolus is visible and there's a membrane around the nucleus and then the centrosome. Okay, wait. Okay, never mind. Skipping over the G2 part because I think that takes away from the actual thing. Okay, so the first actual phase of mitosis is prophase. And so basically, here chromosomes condense and start to become visible. So chromosomes don't usually look like the um, X's that you see. Most commonly, they usually just like kind of float around, but then in this phase, they start to get ready for replication. And then the nucleolus disappears. So I don't know if you guys remember, but the nucleolus is where ribosomal RNA is made. The chromosomes will start to look like the X's and then mitotic spindles start to form. So mitotic spindles are going to be very important later in that they help pull apart the two sister or the pairs of chromosomes so that each new cell gets one pair. So this ensures that each cell has a diploid number of chromosomes. And then the centrosome is where the mitotic spindles actually come out of. So as you can see in this ritual representation here, is my annotate tool working? Yeah, I think it is. So these two are centrosomes. The lines here are mitotic spindles. And then these are the chromosomes and they will start to condense and become visible. So this is prophase. Now moving on to prometaphase, which is when the centrosomes start to move to either side of the cell and then the chromosomes start to line up in the middle, but not exactly because that's what metaphase is. And then, so let me see if I can go back to the previous slides. So, wait, okay, never mind. I think it's on the next slide. So if you see on the diagram on the right, in the middle, there is a section called the Kinetto shore, and this is where the actual spindles like latch onto the chromosomes and start pulling them apart. So those start to form, and then basically everything becomes more polarized. So at this point, the nuclear envelope, so the nucleus is enclosed by a membrane again, and this starts to disappear. Um, okay. 
So then we go to metaphase where the chromosomes actually line up in the center and they start getting pulled apart by these spindles. Um, and then anaphase, they actually do get pulled apart. And then in telophase, you have these two new nuclei form. And then in cytokinesis, the cell pinches in half and you get two new cells. So those are the phases of mitosis. Okay. So there's a mnemonic for this. I do not remember it. But wait, it's like, hang on, I'm going to Google the mnemonic for this right now. It's like mitosis mnemonic. Okay, I prefer milk and tea. So I is interface, prefer is prophase, milk is metaphase and is anaphase and T is telophase. So you can remember I prefer milk and T if you want to know the phases of mitosis and how it works. Wait. How are you seeing what? I'm so confused. All right, bro. Really? Okay. Hang on. The screen share is scuffed. I don't see it. Okay. Hang on. I'm gonna... Okay. Should be on the slide. I think. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so I kind of glossed over some of these later. Um, so the mitotic spindle is what helps with mitosis in that it actually pulls apart the replicated chromosomes. It's formed during prophase and it's made out of microtubules. Don't know if you remember that from the second class, but microtubules are part of the cytoskeleton, and cytoskeleton are just elements of the cell that help it move. So, um, centrosomes organize the mitotic spindles. Okay, yeah, I don't think the rest of this is important. Okay. So moving on from mitosis, we have meiosis. So hang on. Uh, okay, there we go. We're good. So meiosis is basically mitosis, except you have two stages. So in the second or in the first stage of meiosis, Wait, okay. Going back to mitosis, there's no like other set of chromosomes. It's just one cell replicating itself. And so that's why it's like identical to the parent. But then in meiosis, you get two different kinds of chromosomes. And then these chromosomes line up and get pulled apart. So they like crossover is what the term is called and this creates different variations so as you can see on the right the the blue and red represent chromosomes from different sources and they get like all tumbled up and that's why we get different kinds of people and organisms so i have a question for you guys so in mitosis the cell replicates its chromosomes. So that means, let's say the cell originally has 2N chromosomes. And then if it doubles that amount, how many chromosomes does a cell have? 4N, nice. Okay, and so in mitosis, there are two daughter cells. So each of these cells would have how many chromosomes. 
So this close, I think, okay. I think you're misunderstanding my question. So after the cell duplicates its chromosomes, it splits into two cells. So it goes from 2N to 4N. So if it divides itself into two, how many chromosomes would it have? There's, hint, there's an N in there. Okay, so, 4n is how much the cell has right now. So if it divides itself into two, how, oops, 4n divided by two. Yes, okay, good. I appreciate it. Okay, but then in meiosis, the cell also, in meiosis, the cell also uh, replicates its, genome so it goes from 2n to 4n again but this time the but this time it undergoes two divisions as you can see on this diagram there's meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 so this actually makes it go from dividing into two cells to dividing into four cells so how many chromosomes would each of the cells have then yeah okay good so 2N is diploid, so mitosis gives rise to diploid cells, and meiosis gives rise to haploid cells. So this was mentioned before. So binary fission. So because prokaryotes don't have nuclei, then you kind of can't undergo mitosis without having the proper organelles. So they undergo something called binary fission. So binary fission is used primarily or only in bacteria. And so just a quick recap, bacterial chromosomes, unlike our chromosomes that when condensed look like X's, they're actually circular. So there's no like end, but there is something called an origin of replication or ORI for short. And so this is the place where, as you probably guessed, replication starts. So there are two ori found in bacteria. So in eukaryotes, there are like thousands of ori's on their, on our chromosomes. But then in them, there's only two. So one of them moves to the opposite end of the cell during replication. And so this ori elongates the cell. And then the other ori is where the actual like replicating starts. And so because the cell is now elongated, it can pinch in half and give rise to two different cells. So there is no mitotic spindle in bacteria because the cytoskeleton does not really exist, but there is an equivalent and it's there are a bunch of actin molecules. Actin is a inter intermediate filament. And there's also tubulin, which is a motor protein. Both are motor proteins. And then, so there has been some speculation that binary fission is actually how mitosis started because they are very similar mechanisms. It's just that eukaryotes have to deal with a more complex process due to their nucleus. But some say that binary fission came first, kind of like endosymbiosis. All right, so going back to the actual cell cycle. Um, okay, so we can't just have like cells dividing everywhere because I feel like that would end really badly. So this is why we need controlling factors. And so the timing and the rate of cell division are absolutely crucial in any living organism. So this also changes depending on your cell type. So for example, human skin cells are cells that replace themselves like really quickly. 
but then liver cells don't really divide that quickly because they're not as needed. And then some cells don't even divide because the cell cycle just like doesn't allow them to, I guess. So an example of those kind of kinds of cells would be nerve cells. And if you're wondering where nerve cells come from, if like they don't divide, then you can, okay, sorry. Then, okay, so when you're born, nerve cells like, Okay, when you're born, you have like three germ layers and germ layers just means like when you're like a fetus, you have like layers of tissue that you get from your mom and one of those layers, the cells turn into nerve cells, but then you don't like get more nerve cells over time, which is why like some diseases are like neuro degenerative like you can't really cure them because you can't get more nerve cells that was a tangent but okay anyway so it was so there was an experiment and so basically a cell in the g1 phase and a cell in the s phase were fused together and so if you don't so people before thought that like the cell just like went from one phase to another, but then they actually found that signal that was in the S phase cell also signaled the G1 cell to turn into the S phase. So both of them were in the S phase. So this shows that like there are signals that help cells move from one phase to another. So these so these signals help the cell move past what we call checkpoints and it's where cells check for like cancer and other abnormalities and stuff we'll look at cancer more later so the most important point is the g1 point or yeah the most important point is the g1 point and it's also called the restriction point so most cells if they're like bad for the body they die at this point but once you get past this checkpoint then you pretty much are set to become a dividing cell so if it doesn't pass this checkpoint so for example if it's too big if there are not enough chromosomes then it goes into something that we call the g0 phase which is a stage where cells do not divide so most cells uh, are in the g0 phase so i think one thing that I really struggled with when I was like learning this was I had a hard time visualizing like all of the cells because I thought that like G0 was like kind of a place that cells could go if they weren't dividing. But just think of it as like life stages. So if like G1 is like toddler s is like teen and then g2 is like adult and then g0 is like baby because yeah that's what i would say think of it like stages of life maybe that's just something that i personally struggle with but cells in this phase can also be like called back with something called growth with a growth factor and so for example um dwarfism is a disease where like humans are not growing in terms of like height and physical developments as much as they should and this is because they lack something called the human growth factor which allows cells to divide let me see how okay let me look at the time Oh, I think our pacing is pretty good. Okay. Cyclins. So there are two main like signal signaling mechanisms of the um there are two main cell wait. Okay, there are two main signals of the cell cycle, protein kinases and cyclins. So Protein kinases are responsible for phosphorylating all of the DNA. 
So phosphorylating something means add, adding a phosphorus group. And so they are usually inactive in a cell, but then they are activated when something called a cyclin uh, attaches to it. So that's why those are called cyclin-dependent kinases. So an example of the cyclin-dependent kinase is the maturation-promoting factor, also known as or also known as a cyclin CDK complex. So this corresponds to the peak. So if you look on the um, right there, we have a diagram that shows the cyclin concentration in a cell versus the MPF activity in a cell. So as you can see, as there are more cyclins, there's more MPF because it's dependent on cyclin. And so this helps the cell go through signaling and such. And then after the cell passes the G2 checkpoint, it also helps in chromosome condensing and spindle formation, which is why the level like goes up again. So signals can also be internal or external. So in an internal signal would be something that happens within the cell cycle. So for example, the M phase checkpoint um, is, sorry, I'm trying to move the chat, but it's like, okay, there we go. So the internal, an example of an internal signal is the M phase checkpoint. And then, so what happens here is that the, if the anaphase separation of the sister chromatin, wait, sorry, okay. The anaphase separation of the sister chromatids won't happen until the, until the chromosomes actually line up in metaphase at the middle. And then, so the chromatophores also need to attach to the spindle fibers for this to happen. So this is an example of an internal signal because it's like, if something previous doesn't happen, then this thing also won't happen in the cell. Um, so an example of an external signal would just be like not part of the cell cycle. So not enough nutrients, you don't have a growth pack factor, you don't have enough nutrients to help you to replicate your DNA. And so for an example of this would be the platelet derived growth factor, which is a growth factor made by platelets and platelets help block, like when you have a wound, platelets help patch up that wound. And so This helps make sure that cells can pass their G1, the G1 checkpoint like efficiently because they repair it. Um, Density dependent inhibition is also an example of an external signal. And it's when a layer of cells, like for example, your skin, there are like too many cells on your skin and obviously you're just not gonna keep dividing. And so that would stop it. Uh, yeah. So the last slide for today, it deals with cancer. So I think the main takeaway I want you to get out of this class is that cells, the cell cycle is important because it helps. It's not really so much as it helps the cells in your body divide. It's more like it helps the cells in your body not divide too much. And so when it does divide, when cells do divide too much, this can cause cancer. So cancer is caused by cells that are just growing out of control and these cells are not normal. And so if they even do stop growing, they do it randomly and it's not at a checkpoint because these cells don't follow those signals. And so, there have there has been an example of like immortal cells and so it would be called or the first immortal cell is called the HeLa cell and it was found in 1951 and it was from a tumor from a woman named Henrietta Lacks and she had cervical cancer but then after she died her cells just like never stopped dividing and so that kind of shows you how important the cell cycle 
is because they did not have the cell cycle and that's why they kept dividing. Uh, no apoptosis. So can anyone tell me what apoptosis is? You can Google it if you want. So as a hint, there are two kinds of cell death, apoptosis and necrosis. Necrosis is when cells die from outside influences. So like UV radiation, yes. So apoptosis is basically programmed cell death. So when a cell can't function anymore and it's not and it's causing trouble in the body then it will undergo apoptosis if it's healthy but cancer cells don't do that and they keep dividing which is why they get very very dangerous and so sometimes the cancer doesn't spread these are called benign tumors and these tumors are very easy to uh, like remove through surgery because it's not spreading but then once a tumor gets malignant it spreads to other tissues and it starts affecting those cells and those cells become cancer and so when this happens metastasis is what we call it the spreading so these tumors can be treated with high energy radiation chemotherapy uh, which is using toxic chemicals um so there's been a drug called the Taxol that has been used to target cancer because it stops the mitotic spindle from forming in mitosis and meiosis. And treatment is basically getting more personalized thanks to technology. All right. So that was a lot. But good thing is we're going to...